Let's build a West Marches campaign together because by the time this video series is done, we will walk through step by step every process from the beginning ideas to putting the finishing touches on session one. And if you follow along, you will be able to create your very own West Marches campaign as well. First thing that I like to do whenever I'm constructing a campaign is to build out the bones of said campaign. The bones of a campaign for me start out with what I like to call the central conceit. This is the thing at the heart of your campaign, the idea or the principle that is driving you forward. In a West Marches campaign, it's why are you completing these episodic missions? So the central conceit of this campaign revolves around a small army known as the Brigade, which is retreating from the main antagonist of the campaign. Now, this force was beaten in a previous battle and is trying to retreat back to their stronghold across the map. This is the situation in which the campaign takes place. Everything that's happening in this West Marches campaign coming up revolves around this brigade, how they are not as powerful as the antagonistic force, they don't have the resources, they don't have the supplies, they have civilians to worry about. But through it all, they are still trying to succeed. This right here is the backbone on what this campaign is built on. Every mission that players sign up for is to help the Brigade in some way. Whether that be gaining supplies, beating back enemy forces, or maybe just protecting civilians or beloved NPCs. And so, now that I have this central conceit, I can tell this to my players. If you're signing up for this campaign, this is the type of situation that you should be prepared to walk into. But also, because we have this central conceit, it better allows us to create a very unified campaign where everything is working together in harmony. But now I think we need to get to one of the most foundational pieces of any campaign across any system, and that is the villains. Villains are everything in TTRPG campaigns because you can't plan for what the players are going to do. However, you can plan for what the villains are going to do. Now starting off for villains, I like to just get a general tagline concept. So if I'm explaining who the villains are to players, they can kind of get it in their heads pretty quickly. Now the name of the villain for this campaign is Althara the Impure. And a general backstory in the campaign world that I have is Althara is an ancient evil that was locked away and released recently. Now the reason I want to use Althara is because some of my players are the ones who released her. And so I can tie in a previous campaign to this next one. See, that's a fun thing to do as a DM. You don't need to have the consequences of a group of players' actions be even in that particular campaign. The consequences can come down the line and bloom into an entirely different campaign, which is kind of what we're doing here. Now, I already have quite a bit of backstory for Althara, so I'm not going to put it all the way here yet because it lives in other documents of mine. But if you are creating a villain for your campaign, this is where I heavily advise writing down your backstory. And it doesn't need to be complete sentences. I like doing bullet points. Like I could say powerful, powerful necromancer druid here for Althara. I could give any number of background like created the the blood rot uh, 5,000 years ago. Things like that where I don't need complete sentences. I might not even know for certain what the blood rot even does. It's a name that could just sound cool. These four questions, I think, are all you need to answer in a villain's backstory. Who is the villain? Where is the villain? Why are they a villain? and what happens if they win. You could go on for 10 pages about a villain, but that's not necessary. I think the most important thing is to write down things you're actually going to use about your villain. Yes, it might be cool coming up with your villain's family tree, 
But if that's not going to be relevant to your upcoming campaign, I wouldn't suggest starting out with that world building. So let's just quickly fill this out for Althara. Who is she? She is Althara the Impure. Where is she? She's on a she's at a place called the Primordial Ring. My campaign world takes place on three rings. You have the Prime Ring, the Dark Ring, and this ring, the Primordial Ring. It's kind of like the Feywild. It has a certain type of Fey energy and vibe to it. And she's specifically starting at a town uh, called Teprez. Not Yprez. Teprez. Well, I should say it was formerly Teprez. Players of mine did a mini campaign where they actually played out Althara arriving to the Primordial Ring and basically taking down this whole city and beginning her conquest of the Primordial Ring. Kind of like an origin story, so that they could play out what their starting conditions would be in this campaign. Now, why is Althara a villain? This is a big question. I could go on for paragraphs about why Althara is a villain, but to save time, they are a corrupting force loyal to the Titans. Now, the Titans are the big bads of my campaign world. And if the Titans win, reality itself begins to fall apart. So, their corruption is partly why they are a villain. They are impure. They are also now loyal to the Titans. Two reasons why they are a villain. That's enough. Now, what happens if Althara wins? If everything goes her way and the players quote-unquote lose the campaign, what happens? Well, the Primordial Ring is corrupted by the Titans, basically. And we can even go into more about what this word corrupted means. Where corrupted basically means transformed into a plant-human eldritch hybrid creature. You don't want to be corrupted. And that's all we really need to start out with the villain's backstory. Who they are, where are they at the start of the campaign, why are they a villain, what happens if they win. I also like to throw out kind of like a concept tagline. Again, another touchstone for me to use while I'm creating this villain. So, when I'm thinking about Althara the Impure, I'm thinking the last of us zombies meets new Phyrexia. So, last of us zombies, obviously from the Last of Us series, and new Phyrexia from Magic the Gathering, because I really like the Phyrexian lore. I think villains like Elish Norn are really cool. I always wanted to have a villain kind of like that, built on you know, this spreading of infections and spores. Althara's kind of like this dark druid character mixed with the need for conquest that also comes with Elish Norn, New Phyrexia, things of that nature. And just the general concept of everything that comes with this, where if a character falls, they're, they're probably not going to be dead. They'll be revived thanks to the zombies and corrupted and turned impure by Althara. And I like having this concept line because it allows me to give players this quick one-sentence pitch about who this villain is when they're entering the campaign. Who is Althara the Impure? What does her and her faction represent? I mean, it's The Last of Us Zombies meets New Phyrexia. Or Althara is the Flood from Halo meets the Borg from Star Trek. Just having these taglines here really help us to zero in on what we're looking for. We have these weird plant-like eldritch hybrids that are moving across this Feywild-like landscape, corrupting everything in their path. And this brigade of outnumbered, outgunned, outclassed survivors, really not survivors, but soldiers are attempting to save civilians and somehow defeat this threat. And lastly, as I'm constructing my campaign bones, I like to set up victory conditions. And you can think of victory conditions as the villain wins if dot dot dot. 
the villain wins in this campaign, like, they are to the point where they have completed their plan if this happens. So, the victory conditions for this campaign are... So this is what I would write fully as the victory conditions for my campaign. And don't worry, after I read it out, I'm going to break it down into more generic terms. Althara wins if she gets the Scroll of Marapa's Peace, which Zishin stole, and retrieves the Primordial Tree Sap at Widowstone Keep. What does all of this mean? So translated, the victory condition reads, Althara wins if she gets the MacGuffin. The Scroll of Marapis, it's just a MacGuffin, a powerful artifact in my campaign world, which a powerful allied NPC stole. So we know where the MacGuffin is, it's with this powerful allied NPC that is with the Brigade at this point, and retrieves the thing that makes magic. So, this is another MacGuffin, but a little bit more specific. And this MacGuffin, the party doesn't have. But, that particular MacGuffin is where the party is headed. The Widowstone Keep. So if Althara gets these two plot coupons, she wins the game. And I always like there to be two things that the villain has to get before winning the campaign. Because then, if the villain succeeds with half their plan, it's not, quote-unquote, the end of the world. It also allows you to drive up the stakes in a campaign, because if the party loses their MacGuffin, now they are really focused on getting to Widowstone Keep to protect the source of all magic on this ring. But now, with these victory conditions, I can also keep in mind what Althara would be doing if the party did not exist because all she's trying to do is get these two things. So if the party completely bails on the campaigns, not trying to do any missions or help the brigade, what is Althara eventually going to be doing? She's going to be heading to Widowstone Keep. That's her entire goal. If the party offers up the Scroll of Marapis in exchange for their lives, yeah, she'll take it, because that's one of the victory conditions that she has. And with this, can more accurately plan out what might be happening in our campaign and set up missions for our West Marches campaigns that feel like they are constantly moving the plot forward and we can see directly what Althara and her other lieutenants are trying to do. So, highly recommend you have your victory conditions outlined for what your villain wants. What do they want to do? But that's the bones of the villain in this campaign. And I don't like to do any more than this before I get player backstories, because I'm going to naturally want to incorporate what the players create into this villain. Now, I have a really solid shell that if the players wrote zero backstories, I could still run Althara the Impure, but I want to leave enough negative space where the players can add their own elements and aspects into Althara when they begin to play, when they begin to make their backstories. So with that in mind, we can now move on to theme. Theme, I think, is so incredibly important to put into the bones of a campaign, because the theme of a campaign helps to hold everything together, and it makes it feel like we are playing in your campaign rather than in my campaign. But now we can move on to theme. I think theme is so important for any TTRPG campaign, because theme makes your campaign feel like your particular campaign and not another campaign you ran, or your friend Tim's campaign. Imagine theme in your campaign as your paint palette. Actually, I'll put that here just so that we all have it. It's your paint palette. These are the colors and the types of story that you're utilizing to construct your campaign. So, this is where we're kind of choosing what blues we're going to be using if we're not using yellow paint. Now, the players will naturally contribute towards theme as we go, but this is time for us to put our own themes. We have to bring something to the table as DMs, and this is just going to be a quick aside, but DMs should bring things to the campaign. Now, 
what do I mean by this statement here? Well, all of us want players to bring characters that are full of life and creativity and spark with backstories. Or maybe you want no backstories, but we want players to bring things to the campaign. But we as DMs need to bring things to the campaign as well. Obviously, we want space for the players to be able to create. But we have to be bringing something to the table as well. Things that we can show the players and say, Hey, look, I'm putting in this effort. Can you put in a little bit of effort? Because if the players see you doing it, they are much more likely to do it themselves. So what are going to be some of the themes of our West Marches campaign? Well, I, I did a bit of brainstorming before this because theme is one of the things that I think about the most before I'm going to start a campaign. When I first get start getting ideas about a campaign, I start running through what types of things do I want to focus on, at least starting out with NPCs, with world. And the first thing I kind of want to start out with is a theme of perfection versus flaws. Because Althara the Impure is a very imperfect person, an imperfect entity. But I like taking this new Phyrexian ideal of perfection. Althara doesn't believe that she's corrupting the world. I think she believes that she is making this world better. By creating these weird plant eldritch abominations, she is making a hardier world. A world without war, a, war, a world without disease, etc, etc. And her constant striving towards perfection could be her downfall. I think that the Brigade, naturally being adventurers, are going to have tons of flaws. So I kind of like this dichotomy between a, an individual who only wants perfection versus the Brigade who has so many flaws and showing how those flaws aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're what makes us unique. I kind of like in my head if things were going to go perfect, the flaws of each member of the Brigade would help lead to victory. So, I'm going to kind of underline that. Flaws, another big part of the theme that, at least in my heart of hearts, if I had the perfect campaign, I would really like to work with. Um, I would also, I think working with this theme of unification because Althara is trying to quote-unquote unify the Primordial Ring while well, the Brigade has been shattered from a previous battle. So seeing how Althara's version of unification could be very different from the Brigade because the Brigade are all not the same. There will likely be squabbles about what they're going to do. Like tensions will be high. But... Are they more unified than Althara? What is that unification? Do you need to be completely unified to work together? I like these type of uh, stories that we could potentially throw out there. Things like altering nature as well. Althara is trying to corrupt what's basically the Feywild, turning it into a dark version of herself and the Titan's power. What does that mean? And how can we play on the altering of natural cycles? Maybe things like the, the amount of daylight is variable. Like, just an idea for later in this campaign. Showing, you know, the, what the alteration of nature can cause. Maybe it's, you know, quote-unquote best for Althara. I don't know exactly how I'm going to play into this. But I like this idea. And I think I just want to put down here as well the downsides of always seeking perfection. Should people always be striving to be perfect? Well, we can explore that idea at least a little bit with Althara. I don't have these big philosophical answers to these questions, but posing them, that's enough. Like, 
it's up to the players to begin formulating their own answers to parts of this theme. I think also naturally, as this is more a, a military story as well with soldiers, a theme of sacrifice should also be woven in there. I mean, these are soldiers who have lost the battle and they're probably going to continue to need to sacrifice, whether that be resources or perhaps their own men to succeed in this campaign. And I think the final theme that I'm going to throw in here is family and bloodlines, because this is a theme that is present in every single one of my campaigns in this campaign world. I think it's, again, what helps differentiate this campaign world from others. There is a big focus on family, who's your family, the bloodlines, where your power comes from, things of that nature. So I'm going to throw that in there as well. And then we have six really solid themes that we could begin to work with as we go. So that's the bones of a West March's campaign. Our theme, our paint palette, our villain, that antagonistic force which is driving the campaign forward, and then a central conceit as well. This is what people are signing up for. It's the thing that is going to keep us coming back to this campaign. This campaign is about a beleaguered group of survivors, soldiers, trying to defeat an enemy that way outclasses them. So if you haven't already, fill these three sections out as for the bones of your campaign. Don't worry, I'll wait, because next up we can start talking about the home base. The home base is incredibly important in a West Marches campaign. This is what the party is returning to at the end of every mission. So, let's just jot down some quick notes about our home base. These are just ideas that we're kind of brainstorming. Now, firstly, I really want this home base to be mobile. As the soldiers are going to be retreating, having a stationary home base I don't think works with this central conceit. I've never ran a West Marches style campaign with a truly mobile home base. So this is something I really want to try and work with. So I'm going to go for it. Let's make the home base mobile. Also, it is a place of safety. I think that's something important. Um, probably this is a place for upgrading weapons slash armor. Hmm, I think also with this home base, I want to talk about the feel of it. I think the rest of this campaign is going to have kind of a bit of a more drab feel. And a potential problem you can get into with darker campaigns or more military campaigns is not having those places of brevity or light a reason to keep fighting other than just the players not wanting to die, not wanting to lose. So I actually, I think, this feel should be hopeful. I think this home base needs to be a hopeful place. Probably civilians are everywhere in this home base. I'm going to say, well, probably because of that, uh, lots of the brigade stays back so that the base is protected. I think this also would probably help solve the problem of players saying, why don't we take the whole brigade on every mission? Well, I think this is a good answer. You don't want to take the brigade because everyone is so worried about losing the civilians, losing their hope, losing this place of mobile safety. Yeah, I, I really think that this hopeful vibe for the home base is going to be really important to this campaign. Wondering, will there maybe, maybe the upgrades? Maybe that's different as well. Buffs slash upgrades could mean luxuries. Maybe there are luxury places that are just mobile in this home base. Maybe there's a gambling tent that players can go to remove certain debuffs on them or get buffs. Hmm, this could be interesting. Because going on such a long campaign, like 
players might have the opportunity to get a lot of debuffs for their characters over time as they're marching. But that could feel bad. So instead of turning them into debuffs, we could turn like this home base into a buff giving section where we expect players to start out with any number of different buffs as they begin a mission. Uh, like, they could have a gambling tent. That's not how you spell gambling at all. I promise, English is my first language. Um, and I would, we'll have to brainstorm some other luxuries. I'll be right back. All right, I spent a bit of time brainstorming some of these luxury places that the players could interact with as they return to a home base, or they might even take entire sessions just to sign up to do some of these luxuries. I came up with, obviously, a tavern for soldiers. I also thought of bards slash a theater. They could go see a performance, and that might get them a buff or an upgrade, help them relax, deal with some mental stress. I also thought of rat racing. Like, what are some activities that the camp could do while fleeing this army? Well, they might set up these rat racing tracks where they literally race rats in these long tracks. I mean, it's pretty simple, but I think the players would get a kick out of this. And maybe going to see the rat races can get them a bonus as well. The last thing that I have here, well, I didn't create this, the Aztecs did, because the Aztecs had a ball sport that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce because I know I'm going to butcher it. But it's all about kicking a rubber ball through a ring. The players are going to be on the Primordial Ring. I thought calling it Angel Rings and going to see a game, perhaps even playing in a game, having side quests about finding a new ball for the Angel Rings game, hopefully make the home base feel like a place worth fighting for. So I think that's good for the brainstorming. I'm content with how the home base is here initially. I like the idea of getting buffs and upgrades here and that we should take those account into account as missions begin. I like the idea of this feeling like a place of hope and safety. This home base should be chicken noodle soup for the soul. I think that is something that I really want to drive home here. And perhaps even having slowly over time... Ooh, let's have a a reputation system at the home base. I know I was done, but these ideas just keep on popping up. The more missions you do that directly help the civilians in this home base, perhaps the higher the reputation of this character can grow. And then you might have certain events where you know, kids run up to them in the street, you know, people throw out flowers for them. They might go to the tavern and the barkeep says, Hey, this one's on me. Keep doing what you're doing out there. These type of moments that I think are going to be really important for getting these players to fall in love with the home base. This is something I'm going to be kind of circling, especially for this campaign. Because if we go back, these are... The brigade is in a bad, bad shape starting out. They've just had a massive defeat. They're on the run. It could be very easy for some players to just start you know, cutting, running, doing what's best for them, um, making the utilitarian play. I think by having this home base full of hope and good people with a reputation system, it could help give impact to the actions of the players. So I'm going to start setting up different sections of this document now. I'll be right back. So, I have split this document into a few new sections. We have the home base layout, what's at the home base, who's at the home base, a reputation system, and the guiding light. The guiding light, and start here at the bottom, is what we should be thinking about as we add things to this home base, as we're interacting with it. Things to keep in mind as we're improving, because any TTRPG is about improv at its core. There are going to be things that happen that we do not expect, but we don't want to step on the toes of what we've already done. These are like our, our guide notes. This is what we should be keeping in mind as we're at the home base. 
And I've just written out that the home base is a place of safety and good people. This is not a morally gray area. If you're at the home base, 95 to 99% of individuals there should be good. Like there might be disagreements, there might be some gruff people every now and then, but generally this is a safe place with good people. There's going to be enough darkness outside of the camp. I really like this line that the brigade's home is all the hope that they need. This is it. As long as they have their base, the brigade will persevere, they will endure, they will keep going. Now I'll talk about the home base layout. So let me just put some things down. Okay, so this is what a more filled out version of the home base layout looks like. So firstly, I put down mobile here. I usually wouldn't do this for most home bases, but this generally tells me what the movement of this home base is like. It's a caravan of carts and wagons and people. They move from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then they settle down every day. So when missions are going on, we can generally know where the home base is or is not. Let's see, for the layout, uh, this just tells us what the home base looks like, how it's laid out, the structure of it. If this is a stationary home base, we might say that the layout is a village, you know, hidden in the trees, or a dwarven town on the side or inside of a mountain. This just tells us what it looks like. The home base each night is just going to lay itself in a hexagonal pattern. I came up with the hearth. This is basically the center of the home base, so we could set up a little map what the hearth looks like for the players to wander around if we really want to. Then we also have here, Archfey. There are Archfey with the Brigade. Um, they are... And we have Archfey here. There are Archfey with the Brigade. They are the leaders of this Brigade and led the attack on Teprez and failed miserably. This basically says where all the Archfey are. They're at the center of the camp. And they are in their own cabins, which act as safe havens for people. The reason why they're at their center is also listed here, because if more get corrupted, out of the six Archfey that attacked Teprez, three were corrupted. And if more get corrupted, that could end very badly. So the brigade is keeping them in the center, uh, far away from the attacks of Althara and her forces as humanly possible. Then we have here climate. This just, again, tells us the climate. What is the weather like at this location? Terrain, this isn't applicable. This is where you would list where uh, certain geographical landmarks are. Is there a river nearby? Are there mountains? Are you in the middle of a grassland? Whatever. This is where you put that information. And then there's just a section for other. And I just wanted to put here um, that... There are songs and stories and laughter in the air, and despite everything going on, if you were to enter into the home base, you would think that this is a joyous group of people. So that's what I would put in, un in other, but you can put obviously anything in other. It's just the bucket category. Now moving on to what's at the home base. Give me a sec. All right, now let's cover what's at the home base. This particular section is where I'm listing out everything that we have to do at the home base, obviously. First thing that I'm writing out, the arch phase cabins, place where the party can go. And I'm just listing out the cabins of the three arch fey. Just for your information, their names are Cordell, Canastin, and Zetian. Those are their three names. But I also have next up a portable watchtower that this particular caravan carries around and you know, they need a place to keep watch at night. It's a lot easier to just have a portable one, put it up. And I also like this because it gives a space for players to roleplay. Because if two members of the brigade take watch together, they get a plus one to any skill on their next mission. Now, I should make this clear as well. We're not playing D&D &D in this West Marches campaign. So I'll, I'll, I'll have translations here for each buff. 
but for the system that we're playing, this is essentially a plus two to any attribute like strength or dexterity in the D&D system. But that's what we got going on right here with the brigade. Next up though, we have the blacksmith. And usually here, I have a, a managed by tag. I'm not gonna come up with names for these characters right now because coming up with names is long and hard. And I'm probably just going to use a random name generator and pick the best names out of that. But I also have listed here that the blacksmith can upgrade weapons and armor upon request, but it needs materials to do so. Uh, I didn't give it a buff, like this particular location, because I want to give players more incentive to go around the home base. The blacksmith that's an easy place to go. Like, players are going to naturally come here because it's the blacksmith. So I don't want to give them more incentive to only come here. Then I also came up with Yamp's Tent. Uh, Yamp is going to be a gnome. Uh, again, this is this was an idea that spawned out of a name because I think... This camp needs an artificer and they can create new magic items or complete projects if they have materials. So this just provides an outlet for the party if they want new magic items or if they want materials. Yamp can give quests and say, if you go to this town or you can find this thing on a mission, then I can make this magic item for you. Which we like. It's a uh, it's good thing we got going on here. But now we get to start covering the things that we talked about previously. So we have Lucky Eights. This is the gambling tent. I always put what this establishment is, who it's managed by. Then we have a mini game. I wanted to set up mini games for all these things. Uh, for the gambling tent, it's just gonna be a game of blackjack. Um, and I'll come up with those mini games later. Or for you guys, you can find mini games out online, on Reddit, wherever, and use those if you would like. But your locations don't have to have mini games. I'm just trying to put out uh, things that the players can do by while they are in the home base. They're not missions. Um, they're not going to advance the party or the players in any way, but they're just fun things that they could do. And the buff granted is if you come here and you say, I'm going here, uh, before a mission starts, you'll have one reroll on the next mission. Luck is on your side. Uh, then we have the Bitterswill Tavern. Uh, mini games can be arm wrestling. And we have a basically an AC buff that it's granting. Then the stage, a place for performances to happen. I think this also gives a nice bit of role playing opportunity because players could come and perform here. I think it would be really nice to have a performance mini game and see what types of creative uh, things the players could come up with with their own characters for what their performances could be. And this is basically just advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saves uh, if they come here to the stage before they go on a mission. Uh, then we have rat racing. This is something that I'll probably put a lot of time and attention into because the players can train a rat, have it race, watch the rat races, uh, and essentially the buff granted here is you don't provoke attacks of opportunity. So on stealth missions, uh, perhaps the players go and race some rats, see how they're moving. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't need to. It just needs to be fun. Especially because we are trying to make this space fun for the players. There's going to be enough darkness outside of this campaign with the weird eldritch corruption that we have going on. We're, we need to do everything in our power to give light and brevity to some places in this campaign. And we also have, for the last part, Angel Rings. This is the sport that uh, the player is going to be playing. And if you go and you play this sport, essentially you're getting a few more hit points on your next mission. Um, and yeah, th those are the locations we have right now. But over the course of the campaign... All this might expand. They might put in a temple. They might put in who knows what players could put in. We have no idea. But this just gives us a good start to what's in the home base. And you by no means need this many places in a home base. This was something that I could easily do. You might just need 
two or three of these locations and you could pick it up over time. But my advice is you have the what the location is, who it's managed by, what the players can do at this location. Um, and if they can't do anything, then, you know, you can just mark it on the map, but it can feel like a little bit of a letdown. If you say, this is a place you can go, and they say, what can we do here? And it's not really anything. I always like to have something small that the players can do or get from a location. That being said, we can move on to who's at the home base. So, firstly, I would usually only start with about three or four NPCs. Now, I already have details on Cordell, Kanastin, and Zeeshin just because of the previous mini campaign I played before this West Marches campaign. So I just didn't want to start with these three because I already know a bit about them. I know that Cordell is kind of this femme fatale with the heart of gold archetype. She's sometimes called the Lady of Briars. Really cold exterior, but once you break through those thorns, great person, but she's grown reckless because she doesn't want to quote-unquote lose. She still hasn't gotten over the defeat at Teprez, and despite her thorny exterior, she's probably the Archfey that took the loss hardest because she feels a genuine sense of duty to the people. So she's become reckless. That's kind of where she is at the start of this campaign. And it gives us a lot to work with, since the Archfey are helping to run the Brigade, if they're giving quests, quests from Cordell might have a bit more of this reckless tinge to them. Then we have the Archfey Canastin. He ruled over to Prez. He was a great warrior, um, you know, fairly good bureaucrat and politician. However, because of the fighting, he's so heavily wounded, he can no longer fight. And he's kind of mourning the loss of his city right now, where he can't be out in the field, and he's just kind of down on his luck. I don't know what I'm going to do with his character yet. This is probably something that the party is going to have to figure out. Can they rekindle Canastin's fight? Or will he be one of the first Archfey to fall towards Althara because he literally just doesn't want to fight anymore? And then last uh, is the Archfey Zishin. He is practically insane but not he's insane in how he talks how he acts he's actually probably the most intelligent of all the archfey the party's favorite archfey after the last mini campaign as he is wild zany just a fun character to get to interact with and also this seemingly insane archfey is the one who has the scroll of Marapis currently so there's a little bit of tension there now, though, we can move on to kind of talking about how I like to lay out NPCs at the home base as we're beginning a campaign. So, we'll start with the blacksmith. I came up with her character as one of the three or four that we're going to be working with. Uh, her name is going to be Marie Dumont, and she is an elven blacksmith from the city of Teprez. I give her a short backstory just to get to the heart of what she is. We can always add on to this backstory later. This is just the core of the character. And the core of the character is she was a blacksmith for the brigade before the battle. She cut corners as she was supplying a particular platoon. This was the platoon that she was supposed to be working with exclusively. And so she gave them subpar armor and none of them came back. The armor did not protect them. So she carries those deaths with her. Next, though, we can move on to Marie's drive. And the drive of a character is just that. What's driving them forward? What is propelling them to be dynamic and to take actions as an NPC? So Marie's drive is that she wants to create the best weapons and armor and destroy the enemy. She is pushing herself towards absolute perfection because of the time where she let her standards slip and fall. But it's also interacting with the theme of perfection. I always like to tie an NPC back to the themes of our campaign. How are we taking that theme and tying it back with the theme of perfection? We're using Marie. So that's the drive and theme of Marie. And the final thing I like to plug in for NPCs is a potential quest line involving them. So for Marie, it is retrieving better materials so that she can craft her super 
her super weapons, not her stupid weapons, although they might be stupid weapons, because creating those super weapons maybe was foolish. This is kind of like end of her general quest line. So we can have kind of this be the head of her arc where if Marie succeeds in creating these super weapons, she might find out their cost is too high or they are stolen, has to make too great of a sacrifice. And I like adding in this little quest line tag for NPCs because you never know which NPCs are going to be the favorite of a particular party. So just adding in this potential for a future quest line can be really helpful because it's a lot easier to give party quests if they're constantly around this one NPC. I mean, the average D&D or other TTRPG player is much more likely to accept the quest from an NPC that they like. So just always having in the back of your head what potential quests this NPC could give, I think is a great habit for game masters to get into. But again, this is what I'm generally doing before session zero for an NPC, an NPC that I plan to have around for a long time in a campaign. It's not so little that I have nothing. I have a lot that I can use with this NPC. But also, if nothing gets used by them, if the party kills them session one, I'm not going to be heartbroken about it. I can lift aspects of what I've done here and place in any number of other NPCs. And I'm generally going to do the same thing for the other NPCs I have here. And I, I'm not going to necessarily fill everything out here, but like even th with this guy, Tarek Foxworth, he's going to run the Gambler's Tent Lucky Eights. And I know that his theme is going to be embracing fate slash being okay with failure. I like see this NPC having a really interesting place in terms of their relations with fate and luck and failure because they're running a gambling tent, that they can be one of the better voices to tell the party and reinforce a, a differing message of it's okay to fail. You fail all the time. So that's just one idea I have for this character. Um, another character like Castellan Messer. Uh, this NPC I envision as being the individual who runs the Bitterswill Tavern. And my thought process behind them is a character built around family and sacrifice and a way to give the party rescue missions. They might send the party after old tavern regulars, or I also envision them as um, being kind of worldly, having seen the area, having gone out and mapped quote-unquote, the wilderness before everything started being changed by Althara. So I like the idea of this character being the one who's constantly trying to save people and also having kind of a, a mirror right here to someone like, let's see here, like Cordell or Canastin, uh, who can't let go of the past, can't let go of the dead. I really want uh, the fall of Tepres to be hard-hitting because... Multiple members of the party of regular players were at the Fall of Tepres. They had a whole mini arc about it. So making that an important event, I think, is going to be very rewarding. Also, rescue missions, always fun. Breaking into a compound, you can have a stealth element, you can have combat element. Just a way to always get in these type of missions. Um, and then lastly, Yap, the gnome inventor just like the name i like yap uh but also i also i one of the things that i like to do is if an npc has a funny name a that's likely going to be something that the party's going to latch on to but b make their backstory kind of tragic like i think the funniest characters you can twist into also the most tragic so i like the idea of uh Yamp's family being corrupted at Tepres, and they are an inventor that's trying to save them. But also we're going to go with the altering nature theme here. They're trying to alter nature to change biology, and perhaps the cure is worse than the disease? We don't know. Once again, though, I think 
Yamp is going to be playing into themes of not only altering nature, but family and sacrifice and what all that means and honestly letting go of the past, letting go of the dead. But I don't have a lot here for them, at least not yet. See, this is why I really like to wait uh, for a majority of these things for Session Zero to start. I can get a lot done before Session Zero. Like, I'm not... Depending on what type of uh, game master you are, I might have done more campaign prep already than some have done for entire campaigns. But this is what's comfortable for me. Uh, this doesn't take me a long time. Most of the time this has taken me has just been explaining this to you guys. Um, but this is a system that overall works for me and creates campaigns that I enjoy. So I thought I'd share it. Final piece here is this reputation system, which I kind of need to think about. We might come back to this in terms of home base. My general thought process, though, is probably having a simple 1 to 6 system. We have a, a D6 system that we're working with for this campaign. So a 6 is you're known by all. We'll write that down. 6 equals known by by all and beloved one equals known by all and hated so thin, thin that thin line between love and hate um, and I, I kind of like this dichotomy so who knows we might tie this reputation system I don't I don't know I I want to actually say there are no yeah, there are no mechanical benefits for this system. Because I think it's much more interesting. I just and this is my gut feeling right now. If the party being bastards has no impact mechanically on them. Like they could treat people like shit. They could just be getting by making the utilitarian decisions. And everyone could hate them, but they're still on top. So I think it would be that interesting dichotomy between doing the quote-unquote um, moral option or the mechanically best option. I also, I think I want to note here, it should be possible to be loved and also succeed. I don't, I want this to be in the back of my head where maybe just the line that a party went down makes it quote unquote impossible, but I don't outwardly or inwardly want it to be a situation where they have to decide between being loved and being effective. I think that's far less interesting. So I want to make this note for myself in the future. So when I look back to this, I have an understanding of where I'm at. And this is why I also kind of put the guiding light at the bottom as it's it's what the last thing I want to see is. So I could be looking through all of this and then I get to this final note that there shouldn't really be a choice between being loved and also succeeding. Um... And then the guiding light comes here at the end, reinforcing that the home base is a place of safety. And that's what I, I want going forward. However, now that we have all of this set up, I think it's time to now start talking about the introduction document. So let me start running you through this introduction document. And firstly, most of the art you see here is from Band of Blades. Again, I highly recommend this book. A lot of the structure of this campaign is taken directly from that book. I absolutely adore Band of Blades and a lot of what it does, and I can just not recommend the book enough from a lore perspective, from an art perspective, the mechanics that it brings, absolutely fantastic. But first thing that I do in my introduction documents is I give this hook. It's just a few paragraphs that get players interested into the central conceit of the campaign. It lays out pretty much all the background knowledge that they need to know 
I keep it as short as possible. So firstly, I start out with this campaign hook. This hook is just a little bit of narrative flavor to get players interested in the central conceit of this campaign. It's supposed to help players connect to the flavor of campaign I'm going for and give them pretty much any background information they need to begin playing in this campaign. So here we're talking about Althara the Impure and what she's doing. We talk about the fall of Teprez, uh, the corrupted Archfey, which are called the Blossomed. We talk about the surviving Archfey and how they seek to head to Widowstone Keep. Like we're putting all the necessary pieces out there. And ideally we're doing it in under half a page of text. Basically, after reading this, a player should generally know what the central conceit of the campaign is about. Then, moving on, I have an in this campaign section. This is like the heart of the introduction document. This is from a meta perspective what this campaign is about. And I want to break it down into sections for you. So, I give the high level in this campaign. Once again, we're setting up the central conceit. I talk about the goals of the players. I say your goal is to gather allies, protect the civilians traveling with you, and attempt to not be caught by the oncoming hordes. This is high level what to expect from the campaign. Next up, I talk about the style of the campaign. I refer to it as a West Marches style campaign. I also say when this campaign is expected to be run, just at the start. And here I'm also talking about the episodic nature of the campaign. Now, I've named this campaign Salondis. The reason I've done so is Salondis is a, a type of not only flower, but also a butterfly. I really like Althara coming back to this metamorphosis metaphor of perfection. Like the ring is metamorphosizing into something new. And this really comes back to the idea of change, which I think is present in the campaign as well. Just a little side tangent and aside for all of you there. Uh, but I also talk about the nature of this campaign, how the missions are episodic. And a, a quick note, because I even say here that they're designed to be completed in one to two total sessions. Uh, when I did my how to run a West Marches campaign, like general guide video, I saw some people in the comments asking questions about what happens if you can't complete a mission in one session. And some people in the comments said, you can absolutely never end a mission in a West Marches campaign out in the wilderness. And, um... No, like, that's just not right. I've done it literally dozens and dozens of times. I mean, you can set it up beforehand and say, this mission likely to be a two-parter. If you're planning it, you can tell players, hey, we have a lot of players coming. I think it's going to be multiple sessions. Let's plan for that. Or just in the middle of the session, you could say, hey, are you guys okay if we drop the session here and we'll all plan for a different time to meet back up. And we'll finish this. Like, you don't need to be constricted by these arbitrary rules. You can have West March's missions that continue for three, four, five sessions. Like, who cares? As long as that same group of players meets back up again, you're fine. You could have your own little mini arcs in the campaign for all I care. So don't worry about having a West Marches campaign mission that goes on for multiple sessions. It really doesn't matter, as long as you can get people back together for the session again. If you got together once, you can get back together again. In most circumstances, that is. Uh, I then also bring up here how, hey, friends, family, co-workers, everyone's welcome in this campaign. Because it's a West Marches campaign. A Salondis is a type of campaign that I want players to feel more than welcome uh, joining. Then I talk about the system that we're going to be using right here. System's not really important for this video, but I just talk about it. If your players are used to D&D &D 5th edition, 
then you're just going to say D&D 5e here. Or maybe you don't even need to say, say it because D&D is so ubiquitous. Um, then afterward, I kind of put here what my DMing style is like. Uh, and what I imagine this campaign kind of being. Like, I I imagine Solandus to be a very open campaign, but it's not designed to be a pure sandbox. There are forces acting upon the players. There are goals being put in front of them. If you want to hop the brigade and go do your own thing, that's cool. Your characters can do that. You're just going to need to make new characters or find a DM who's going to run that campaign for you, because that's not going to be me. The central narrative of Solandis is the Brigade. That is what we're coming together to focus on. You need to be creating characters that work within the Brigade and are answering these questions. This is even pre-Session Zero. You know, this is session negative one. I like to think about this introduction document as it's like a session negative one. And here, making it very clear, it's all incredibly open, but there is a central narrative being driven forward. So that's kind of the bounds of the campaign. I talk about it. it's a strong central story where you should always feel like there's something you can accomplish without feeling rushed to complete it. Um, there is a ticking clock, but you have, you know, so many missions that I'm planning on doing with near limitless ways to tackle them. You're not being railroaded in that way. However, everything is building towards getting to Widowstone Keep. Like, that is your hope in this campaign. Now, if they are to somehow find another way other than Widowstone Keep, I'm not going to stop them. However, from where I sit in the GM seat, I think Widowstone Keep, for a lot of reasons, is their only hope. Because, as you guys now know, at Widowstone Keep is the font of a type of magic, of this primordial magic. That's one of the two pieces... Althara needs to take over the Primordial Ring. Like, if you abandon that place, I don't know right now how the party succeeds. I'm not necessarily trying to railroad them there, I just don't see another way from my perspective. So I want to let them know about this ahead of time. That there is a threat, NPCs and everyone else are heading there, the, the point is keeping the brigade alive to get there. Uh, so making that, again, very clear up front for when players are signing up for this story. And if you don't want to play in a campaign like Solandis, cool. Like, that's why we have this introduction document. There are players who say, I'm not really aboard this whole train. Like, more than fair. That's why we have this. Not every campaign and not every DM is going to fit every player out there. So I think it's very important to have this type of document up front so we can tell our players who we are, what we're about, and let them make an educated decision on whether or not this campaign and this group is right for them. Next up, though, we talk about theme. Themes of perfection and its faults, unity, the ramifications of changing the natural world, sacrifice, and of course family and bloodlines. And you can see now from the planning we've done, we've woven these themes already into this campaign. All these themes are present in the villain, they're present almost in the world itself, they're present in the NPCs. Here, I am actually going to throw in one here. I think themes of, of change as well really fit here. How things are changing. Um, primordial magic is the magic of change. Of converting energy of one kind into energy of another kind. 
So I think this theme would work well. See, we these themes are constantly changing, even now. I'm thinking of themes that are even retroactively working. All this is not static. It's not set in stone. Like, it's all up in the air. That goes for this section as well, campaign length. So for a more linear campaign, I will give a, a more accurate length that I kind of expect the campaign to end by, even just to keep me on target. I think having a, a designated end date kind of really helps, even in a sandbox campaign. Because if you can say, hey, we're ending this campaign X, like, in, like next December or something like that, or whatever, in two years' time, come hell or high water. Like, we have an endpoint. It might end before it, but this is kind of the final deadline. I think it helps really keep campaigns in focus and on track. Here I say it's really player-dependent, because it is for a West March's campaign. The moving of the brigade is up to the players, and we'll get into how brigade movement works properly a little bit later. But I envision this being about 50 to 70 total sessions. That's 50 to 70 total missions carried out. And I also say three to four seasons. Seasons are how I break up campaigns. If you've heard me talk about narrative arcs before, check out this video right here if you haven't. Narrative campaigns are how I chunk up campaigns so they constantly feel fresh and like they're moving. And for players, I talk about them in terms of seasons, like a season of a TV show. So if we're dealing with narrative arc A, that's season one. For narrative arc B, that's season two. Uh, I keep it moving like that. And then I kind of have this ending stinger at the end where I just say, hey, if all this sounds good to you, I invite you to join Solandis. So that is how I set up the in this campaign section. We hit all the notes of what you're doing in the campaign. What's the campaign style? Who's welcome in this campaign? What system are you using? What is your DMing style in a campaign? What are the themes of a campaign? What is the campaign length going to be like? If you don't know, you can just say, I got no idea of length. I hope it ends by X. Or maybe you say, this is something we'll talk about in session zero. How long are you guys wanting this campaign to go on? Because if you say, if players say infinite number of time, you know, you're kind of in the clear there. I like to say, though, like after about two or three years, most campaigns start getting a bit stale because players want to play different things. So just keeping that in mind, finally ending Stinger. Then I have a character creation section. This is basically talking about like what you need to do to create a character for this campaign. I say the system, the level characters we'll be starting at. This is a campaign world thing. Aether Souls means something in my world for all these players. You guys don't need to worry about it. Basically, I'm going to say it anyway. If you're not an Aether Soul, you use uh, the Gritty Realism rules, essentially. Your injuries take longer to heal, yada, yada, yada. So players are going to be kind of keeping that all in mind. Um, then talking about starting conditions for the character. Your character will start as a rank-and-file soldier of the Brigade. And I'm saying 21 days since the disaster of Tepres... You are in a wandering group of soldiers trying to get back to enemy lines. We have where we're starting. We're not starting in a tavern. We're starting out in the wilderness. You guys are trying to get back to the home base. So likely, session one is going to be getting a group of players back to home base. Whatever that initial group is, the players, they are going to be getting there. Um, and maybe if we split up into multiple groups, West March's style of getting there, it's going to be multiple groups of players getting back to home base for the first time. It's going to be an exciting few sessions. I think it's a very cinematic way of starting a campaign. 
then I talk about um, where the character sheet template's going to be. We use a Google Drive folder for all that. Uh, we also use Foundry for a virtual VTT. I can't say enough good things about Foundry. I think it's the best virtual tabletop on the market. I've used things like Roll20. Uh, Foundry blows Roll20 away. I think Foundry is legitimately like two years ahead of Roll20 at all times. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's great. And I have a YouTube link here for my players where they can go watch a video and it's a step-by-step -step tutorial about how to join the server and how to do everything in a campaign. I'll probably update this as well just so that new players can have a literal step-by-step -step YouTube video of this is how you get on the Foundry server. Uh, this is how you create a character sheet, X, Y, and Z. Then I have a backstory section of a campaign. And this is just how I set up backstories for my campaigns. This is what I have found to be very effective over years of doing this. This is what helps me produce some pretty high quality backstories for players. It also helps players, um, you know, get backstories that are better, than I think, what they would originally start with. So I request a basic backstory basic backstory. This is an outline of your character's backstory. And in session zero, we also kind of talk about this a bit, usually with players or players ask me about it. This is bullet points. This is a sentence or two about what you're expecting your character to be. So if you show up at session zero, you have something. Uh, usually also kind of requesting just a working character sheet. It doesn't need to be your final one, just something you can use with enough backstory to have you play one session. Uh, all of it is considered a rough draft, but it's just to say, just to get players thinking about what they want to do, because a lot of times players just struggle to start. This says start. This is the start deadline, if you will. Start your backstory by this date. And then I'm like, hey, final backstory, what you want me to start incorporating into plot webs and all the behind the scenes stuff, all that stuff is due November 12th by 8 p.m. These times, I'm a very busy guy. I like to, to set these deadlines because <laughs> when I'm running so many campaigns, I'm trying to do this YouTube channel, I got a job. It's tough to wrangle things. So I just say, this is the deadline, this is the time, get it in. Um, and usually works pretty darn well. Always you're going to have players who are scrambling at the very end because there are procrastinators amongst every party. Really, this deadline should say uh, November 13th by noon. But, like, it's something I'm aware of that players are going to be a little bit late. If I really needed all backstories in by this time, I would probably say November 10th by 8 p.m. so that I really got everything nailed but this is the time that I can live with you know and then I just say this longer the better for a backstory I just leave this line in so players don't feel guilty about writing long backstories if you have the time to write it I have the time to read it like I do I don't care if you write a longer backstory it just gives me more to work with and then I have little thing here, how players can make intertwined backstories, but you both just need separate backstory documents thrown in there because of reasons that you'll see later on. Um, I just have a few tips then for backstory creation for players. And these are tips that I give to literally anyone. I, I say add in unknowns and mysteries because I think the unknowns and mysteries and backstories are vital. If you know everything about your backstory, that gives me no room to play with. That gives your character very little room to grow. Then I talk about concepts over events. Focusing your character on a concept, on an idea, on a situation that you're role-playing is a lot better than focusing on one event. Focusing on that time where my family was killed by goblins uh, like, there's only so much you can do with that backstory. Focusing on how that character now perceives 
all threats to people and how they are now hyper vigilant and almost overprotective to the nth degree, that's a very interesting character that any DM can work with because they are a concept. I can throw out things that attack that concept endlessly, no matter the, se the session, no matter the situation. The event, eh, I can only do so much. Like I say here, building your backstory around one thing is very difficult. Ideally, we want multiple concepts in the backstory. You want to be dealing with multiple themes. You see how in this campaign, we have multiple themes here. Ideally, if you're going to be playing a character for perhaps years, having multiple themes in your own backstory is a good idea. Uh, and then, again, don't know everything about your backstory. I use the metaphor of a backstory as a foundation, not a finished house. We're finishing the house in the campaign. Don't give me a finished house. Uh, don't give me a house that's not built on a foundation. I think the concept is foundation. So that's those are the tips I give to all my players. But this is just how I prefer my backstories being given. If you have any preferences for backstories, I suggest you put it them here when you are creating your introduction documents. Then, this is kind of like my secret sauce, I think, for getting players to write backstories. I, I literally just ask questions in this document. I'm like, hey, answer these questions so that we all have something to build on. Like, if you struggle with getting players to write backstories, fire out some questions for them to answer because I've had players who they will write three sentences for their final backstory and then literally like 95% of their backstory comes off these questions. They would have given me nothing otherwise, but these questions come through. So the questions for this campaign are, which ring are you from? That says a lot in my campaign world. Why did you join the brigade? Why, what's your reason for fighting? Then, how did you survive the Battle of Tepres? Like, this gets the players thinking about their recent history. Who or what did you lose in the, during the Battle of Tepres? Again, this kind of goes back to theme. How did you survive? I think that kind of goes to a little bit of sacrifice. This 100% like ties into the theme of sacrifice that we're trying to tie in here and potentially even family and bloodlines why haven't you deserted the brigade yet a, a big question here um tying back to the themes of the campaign why didn't you change like that's another way we couldn't we could have asked that question so just trying to poke at things for characters and getting into their mind, getting into their inner workings. We're trying to draw concepts out of people who are not writers. So we need to give them a little bit of help. Then here, I like to do this for West March's campaigns. Which of the lieutenants or the infamous do you have a vendetta against? So, let me go back here. Uh, when we go back to the campaign bones. The villain... Zalthar the Impure, and technically the Titans that are behind her. There is really one Titan, but I don't want to give everything away here just yet. However, in a West Marches campaign, you should be prepared to deal with multiple, multiple villains. So, for all of the Blossomed, for all of the converted Archfey, I went and I created... Uh, infamous and lieutenants. Some of them I just took directly from Band of Blades and their concept. Because Band of Blades has a whole list of, uh, of villains and basically like mini-bosses that they just have in their campaign world. So, why do more world building than we absolutely need when we can just take these characters and go off with them? So like, if we have Amos, they're an Archfey. They're built around decay, poison, the warping of flesh. They yearn to destroy all natural life. Like, 
that's a... That's technically a lieutenant, but a big antagonist for the campaign. Like, players can be against this Blossomed. Probably not going to defeat them alone, though. But the Infamous, these are, like, actual, like, mini-bosses in my mind. And the Lieutenants, these are more directors of evil, if you will. Like, these are, are characters that players can have personal relationships against. And in Session Zero, players can ask about some of these infamous, some of these lieutenants, as they were escaping in the past 21 days, maybe a player ran into uh, to Bloodsword Tristan, a, uh, or Tristane, a, a hulking knight with a hole in their chest, um, and like who beheads the, their victims and reanimates them. Like, maybe they ran into this dude, and they did some shit during the fall of Tepres, or while they were out. Like, we, we're giving players, like, plot hooks before the campaign starts to latch onto. And maybe a player goes and they write a bunch of stuff about Bellatrosh, uh, a pegasus filled with dark magic that hunts the main roads. Maybe they write a ton of things that we never intended to be a part of like this mini boss however like a player feels a connection to a concept like we're giving them every opportunity to hook into this campaign so you don't need to be uh this thorough with you know your campaign prep but giving potential antagonists for players to latch on to um, can be a good idea. Can be a good idea. Won't work for every West Marches campaign, but in this one, I think it's a a good thing. Like you could easily replace this with um, what's a treasure that you're seeking? What's someone that you're looking for in the wilderness? Like, what is something you're trying to accomplish? Or this question specifically is prompting connection to our campaign. Then. Next up, we start diving really into, like, just character. Like, these are questions we could ask in isolation without being in this campaign. What are two flaws about your character? In a campaign about perfection, with themes about perfection and flaws and unification, it's very important for characters to have flaws. What are two flaws that your character has? And then that gives, like, a player might look at this and it's like, oh, like, these are flaws that are weaknesses. But we now know behind the scenes, since, like, perfection isn't everything, that's a message that's hopefully going to come through in the campaign, we now have months, if not years, to start thinking about how maybe some of these flaws, like, are strengths or could be turned into strengths. How, because you are not perfect, you are actually stronger. So, once again, we're tying theme into campaign. This is a question I get a lot from commenters. How do you tie theme into campaign? So this is why I'm really focusing on integrating theme. Uh, name a lie that someone has told your character. This works really well for role-playing. Because, like, a player might leave this lie open-ended. They say, this detail is a lie. However, they don't fill out why it's a lie. So, like, my father is dead. It's like, okay, like, your father isn't dead. Are they undead? Like, where are they? Like, like there's so much open there. Or the lie can be more concrete. Like, I believe that I am cursed. However... That is a lie. Um, an evil witch is working against me. Like, that is a less open-ended lie. But it still gives something for your player to build on. We're helping our players along here. Then, name one ideal that your character holds above all others. This helps with roleplay. Uh, name one thing that your character wants but cannot have. And then name one thing your character needs but doesn't want. This is the core of all characters. Like, literally all characters. Characters have wants, but 
Like, they can't have what they want. It's this dichotomy. And characters have needs that they don't want. And it's that tension between want and need that leads to great stories. I think a good example of want versus need is Luke Skywalker. Because Luke Skywalker, at the start of Star Wars Episode Four: New Hope, he wants to be a pilot, but he also wants to stay on Tatooine. He's got a lot of wants, but like, he wants to stay on Tatooine, he can't have that want. Uh, he wants to be a pilot, that's something he could have, yeah. Like, all the wants don't need to be cannot have, like, he can be a pilot, but he can't stay on Tatooine. Or, like, Luke needs to be a Jedi. Like, he, he needs to do all of these things, but he doesn't necessarily want to. When Ben Kenobi says, hey, let's, let's leave, he's like, nah, I don't want to go on this dangerous mission. So, this dichotomy, if you, if you put nothing else, have players answer these two questions. Give them time to answer these questions. These are incredibly important. So this is my secret sauce for awesome backstories. Asking questions. Asking pointed questions that set players into the world, that deal directly with themes, and help players who aren't professional writers write epic characters. Then I have a, a little link section. This is where I... Now after this... I have a link section in the campaign. This is where I just put all the links that players are going to need. Like, for instance, world information. I have a link that goes directly to PDFs with all my world building on them. Now, again, I, I have a, a big world here, um, like a, a fucking massive one. I run seven campaigns a week. And I run for more than 30 players now. So, like, me having world building of this size is not necessary for everyone. But if you do have world building documents, eh, put them here. Like, it's a good thing. Players don't necessarily need them because everything the players should need should fit here. Like, that's all they really need for this campaign. Uh, if if they go out of bounds in certain other places in their backstory, you know, just work with them on it. Like, you can come back later and uh, basically say, hey, uh, that thing doesn't work, we're just going to alter it, we're going to tweak it. You can play one session with backstory still being a little bit vague. That's fine. I like to think backstories truly solidify in session two or three uh, in reality. But... Now, that's, that's how I have things set up. Uh, players go here to get their campaign documents, things like that. But just putting all the links in one place. And then I essentially say when the campaign's first session's going to be. And this is just a little something I like to do. I like to create um, basically like posters for sessions just to get players interested and kind of get them like in the feel of the campaign. So, like, Solandis. Like, everything except a few things. Like, the dark magic in the undead. The blood on the sword and on the name. Or, like, the small rune on this crow's um, helmet. Like, those are the only things that are lit up in color. Those are the most prominent. The most prominent things are, are the bad things. So, yeah. This is the introduction document. At least... As of right now, the last thing we're going to get into for this video is the Session Zero Checklist. See, a lot of new DMs know that they should probably do a Session Zero, but they don't actually know what should be in a Session Zero, how to structure a Session Zero. So I just want to take you through a checklist that I usually use. This is my generally completed Session Zero Checklist for Solandis. But before we get into all of this, which is specifically tailored to the Solandis campaign, I want to go over a very basic Session Zero template that I like to use. Firstly, when you're starting out a Session Zero, I like to have a welcoming or introduction part of the Session Zero, just so that players that don't know each other can get introduced, 
and so that everyone can get on the same rapport. Maybe you want to play a board game before session zero or just get talking, hang out, get the camaraderie between players first and then start diving into the game. Afterward, I like to start tackling player behavior, first thing. And player behavior being like a table alcohol policy, um, general table rules that you might have, pet peeves, and how you'll handle certain topics in the campaign. Uh, these are just a few that get brought up pretty often, but this is where you talk about things that could irk you about player behavior. I like to tackle that first and foremost. Then after that, I go into topics. Now, the topics are if you have a topic in a campaign that you would like to stay away from, like sexually explicit material or um, themes of like torture, horror, gore. This is where we talk about all of that stuff. And it also gives the players an opportunity to speak up and contribute to what they would want to see in the game. This is the opening part where the players are helping to set norms between each other and with you. Uh, I think also when we're talking about topics, it's important to bring up topics that you think might be brought up in the campaign coming up. So like for Solandis, if we are having this weird eldritch plant corruption, body horror is something that might come up in the campaign. So we can talk about that now. Uh, I also make it very clear that if we ever venture into a topic that players don't want to tackle, that they can quickly tell me, either in person, shoot me a quick DM, we'll brush right over it. And if there is something in the future or something that they don't want to say publicly that they don't want to interact with, then they can talk to me whenever. It's about creating an environment where everybody can be happy while they are sitting down to play this game. Uh, and having that space at the end when you're discussing topics where you can say, this is an ongoing discussion, and even if you have a topic in mind but you don't want to bring it up right now, that's completely okay. Uh, that particular ending has gotten so much good out of players. Then, after we cover player behavior and topics, then I move into who I am as a game master or a dungeon master. I talk about my particular style. If you're a new game master, then you might not have a style yet. And so you can say, I am hoping to model myself after X or I don't know what I'm doing. So keep that in mind. If you have any house rules, now's a good time to bring them up. House rules can be a huge point of contention between players. If there's a house rule that they really don't like. So bringing them up first and foremost here, I think is incredibly important. Uh, and after you bring up house rules and you ask this question, is there any house rules that would make a player uncomfortable playing with them? Uh, like brutal, like nat one failure tables, for instance, uh, is a very hotly contested one among some players. Then, this is the time to talk about them, and I would recommend as a DM you being very receptive to players not liking house rules. Now, if it's a campaign rule, which is, you know, this campaign is full of rogues. It's a rogue-only campaign if you're playing D&D &D 5e. You know, that's a little bit different. That's a rule that you're probably not going to budge on. But if it's a rule like, um, I don't know... Spellcasters have half the health they usually would. Uh, that's something that maybe you consider budging on. Then I go and I talk about the tone and the style of a campaign. And tone and style are things like, is this campaign supposed to be a dramatic campaign or a comedic campaign? What's the level of lethality like in this campaign? Should players expect to have their characters dying all the time? What's the system you're using? Uh, is PvP okay? Are you more of a dungeon crawling DM in this campaign? Or like, what's the frequency of combat? All of those conversations should be had here. 
And then the uh, particular topic that I like to bring up next, uh, and tone and style also brings in theme. So if we're talking about the theme of perfection in a campaign, I would bring it up as part of the tone of the campaign while I'm talking about theme. So if I had to talk about theme, I'm talking about it here. And after all that, I say basically this sentence. If I had to sum it up, blank is central to this campaign. Like, what is this campaign about? So for Salandis, it's if I had to sum it up, how people deal with change and the need for perfection is central to this campaign. Themes of change and perfection, central to it. If you have to understand or try and link a character into that central theming, you can do it based off this sentence. And having that one sentence pitch on theme, I think is really important. And then I go into some more general things. What's the story like in this campaign? Are we doing a more linear or sandbox campaign? How much are we going to be using backstories? How much narrative control uh, over the course of a campaign will the players have? Not just overall, but session to session. Is this a player-driven campaign? Uh, or is it a more DM-driven campaign? And honestly, this should be a discussion between you and the players. Because maybe you're going in wanting to run a sandbox campaign, but the players don't want to run or don't want to play in a sandbox campaign. I've had multiple players tell me they don't like playing in sandbox campaigns. So this is a good conversation to have. Then after this, I like to talk about length. Now, these are expected lengths. Like, do you have an expected endpoint? Is there a level that you expect to campaign to end at? If you're not an experienced campaign, or not experienced dungeon master, not campaign, you're not a campaign, you're a person. But if you're not an experienced game master, then you're, you might not have an understanding of how long the campaign will go. But this is where you can give your best estimate. You can just say, in my best estimate, I think this campaign will go on for a year, two years, or it might go on for 50 to 70 sessions. And... And you can talk about what happens if it goes shorter, what happens if it starts going longer, are the players okay with a longer campaign? These are good conversations to have. Then, what are your expectations and desires from me? What are some things you expect from your game master? This question, I'm going to bold it, it's so incredibly important. Because it allows players to speak up right here and now if they want particular things from you, like uh, if you're wanting to play a wizard saying, hey, as a game master, I would really like it if there were spell scrolls to be found across the world so I could add them to my spell book. If that's part of your fantasy as a wizard, as a player, you know, you speak up and you can leave that expectation right there. Uh, this is a, a very important question. I don't think a lot of newer DMs ask. After that, we get into scheduling. Scheduling can sometimes be the bane of all TTRPG games. I should really make an episode dedicated to how I schedule sessions and how to have consistent scheduling with grown adults. Uh, because it can be very difficult. But this is the point in a session zero where... If you get past these barriers, right, if the players like each other, if they understand what expectations you and other players have for them, if they're okay with the topics of the campaign, and they're okay with your DMing style, then we start talking about schedules and absences. Because it might be, you know, players like, I don't really want to play in this campaign after hearing all of this. And that's okay. Not every campaign is meant for every player. So, that's why we have schedules and absences towards the middle of the session zero, I'd say. So, we ask questions like, when is this campaign meeting? This is where we hammer out the scheduling beforehand. 
Uh, how long is the campaign going to be meeting for? I recommend about three hours if you want to play weekly, two to three hours. Are we meeting in person, virtually, or mixed? Big question. Uh, virtually, you'll get a lot more participation, usually, as you don't need to trek to a person's house or a particular place. In person, I think, is a much more special experience. And mixed is literally just that. If it's about 30, 70. Uh, so it's not like all of you are virtual, but occasionally when all of you are in town, you'll have an in-person session. Uh, this is for a truly mixed experience where you don't really know if it's going to be in-person or virtual until 48 hours before. Uh, then we start talking about things like, what is the level of commitment like in this campaign? So commitment being uh, how often do you expect players to show up? Are you how, like, what are you looking for in terms of, you know, backstories being uh, submitted? What are you looking for in terms of just overall participation? Are you okay with players missing half of the sessions? And just no showing. Like, what is the level of commitment that you and the other players are expecting? Great question to ask. Then, and this is another good one, if you're going to miss a session, what should happen? This is two-pronged. If you're going to miss a session, do you want a heads up as a DM? Usually you're going to want to. A heads up. Uh, what are you expecting in general if a player has to miss? Because life does happen. But this question isn't only directed at the player who is going to miss, but the group. When are you canceling a session uh, in terms of player absences? For me personally, if we have at least 51% of the players of a certain campaign, we're playing in that session. Like, we're not canceling. But it might be different for your group. There are some DMs where if even one player is missing a session, they're not running. I would highly discourage you from doing that. That policy is one that I have seen kill a lot of games previously. And it can lead to instances where you're not playing for a month, two months, three months, just because the session is constantly canceled. Because life happens to everybody. So this is where you get your scheduling down. And you can start hammering out what works. And again, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh... If you're doing a weekly campaign, ideally, you should be keeping this consistent. But in six months' time, if schedules change, you can revisit this conversation. Session zero is just that, session zero. But the conversations within a session zero are never supposed to stop. After this, though, after scheduling, we can move towards world information. Look, DMs out there, I understand that you have these great big worlds that you're dying to tell your players, but most of the time you're just going to psych them out. That world building means nothing to them, so don't try and give them everything right at the start. My recommendation, give the big ideas that your players need to know before they can start playing. So literally, make bullet points. Make bullet points of what you need to update your players on so that they can start playing and making characters for session one. That's my recommendation. Any non-necessary information, leave it. If it becomes relevant, you can bring it up. But if it's never going to come up in the campaign, then why are you cluttering your players' brains with it? You don't really need to do that. Then we have a player wish list. These are questions like, what do players wish was going to be happening in this campaign? So, now that we have the world building info, we have your DMing style, some topics, now players have had time to generally think about what their feelings on the campaign are. So we should ask them, what do they wish is going to happen? What is their wish list? What kind of missions do they want to go on? Is there a particular situation that they hope would occur and this can be privately sent as well but it's just to get players thinking and so that they can tell you things that they are going to be interested in i have a player who loves stealth missions and he'll always say 
I want stealth missions in the campaign going forward. Like, what in any campaign he's in. And him bringing it up will let other players know, oh, he really wants to go on these stealth missions. And it's not only helpful for me as a game master, but I think it's helpful for all the other players because if there is a choice between going in guns blazing and stealth, they know that another player really wants to do stealth. So it helps them to understand where everyone else is at. And this is great if you have a new party of players that don't know each other and are just getting the hang of playing together in a cohesive group. So player wish list, great. There is also kind of a hidden thing in here that may or may not be possible for your campaign. I like for players to collectively create something before we move into discussing their characters and their questions. So for Solandis, we're going to create a character uh, that's going to be an NPC at the home base. But for your campaign, it can be just about anything. It could be a villainous lieutenant. Uh, it can be a like a grand arch mage that's traveling around. It can just be anything. But the act of collectively creating, I think, is a good way to bind together parties and to have a lot of campaign investment, especially investment in one particular NPC right off the bat, because the players created that NPC. So definitely some tip to throw in there, where we'll have uh, create an NPC as a party. And I'll show you more of that when we actually get into reviewing the Solandis Session Zero doc. And then the last thing that I'd like to do with a Session Zero, the very last thing, is discuss characters. And or create characters if it is a system that the players don't know, to ask questions. This is where I usually like to have players go around and give their name, talk about a concept they have for a character, so that everyone knows uh, where they're at in general. So despite this being one of the shorter bullet points in the whole Session Zero template, it's one of the ones that's probably going to take the longest, as you're going to be going around answering questions, helping players through potentially a new system. So keep that in mind. And usually, at the end of this session is where I'll give a backstory deadline. Something like, hey, I'd like your backstories in by X date. And set those general standards, uh, communicate backstory deadline, when is our planned first session, and things of other importance like that. One thing I heavily discourage though, especially if you're doing a custom campaign, a homebrewed campaign that you've created yourself, not just run from a book, but I even discourage it if you're running from a pre-written module, is to start the session, like session one, right after session zero. I think it's really good to allow this session zero time to breathe, time for players to reflect on their characters, to take in everything that's happened here. And honestly, a session zero can be exhausting. You know, I am more drained after a session zero than I am after an eight hour campaign. Uh, so keep that in mind. I usually like to space them out, even if it's session zero on Friday, session on Saturday. Like, that's so much better than just trying to stack session zero with session one. So, little piece of DMing advice for all of you out there. But now, we can get into how I will actually set up a session zero for Solandis. These are, this is an example of my own notes going into this. So, start off introductions, welcoming, you guys already know. Then I'm laying out just a general list of things that I want to bring up to my players. My number one rule is to be respectful of the fun that others are trying to have, and think about how actions impact other people just other than you. So understand that you are not only having to balance your own fun, but look around at other people at the table. Because like I always say, TTRPGs are a team game. And this is where I will echo that sentiment here. 
Uh, then I will also talk about my expectations for drinking. Personally, I don't like drunk people at my table. Uh, uh, a beer is okay, but generally I run some very high stakes campaigns. So most players prefer, hey, just stay sober while we're playing for like three hours. Uh, also, bringing this up, please stay off of cell phones, at least for me, as I'm talking to my players and we go into that. What does it mean to stay off of cell phones? Why do I personally wish that? And then just wrapping it up with other bits of player behavior that uh, the players who are in this campaign would like to bring up. Then we go into, of course, topics. For me, the one I was I always bring up is sexually explicit material. I don't want that played out at a table. I just want it to fade to black. And I have other topics that I think are going to pop up in this game, like body horror, gore, PTSD. Like, we know all of this because we did the work on the NPCs, on the themes, on the villains ahead of time. So we can bring up some of these topics. And I might add more to this list before the actual session zero occurs. Uh, then I talk about my own DMing style. And I've given my own DMing style a lot. So I don't really even need to write it down. It's kind of like a service pitch at this point. But I also have written down here the themes that are probably going to be covered, summing up everything, how this will be a serialized campaign, uh, and just basically a lot of other points of information. Then we also have schedules and absences in here. Now, West March's campaign is very different from any other campaign, so the schedule is a little wonky, and I'll talk to my players about how it is very flexible. In the intro document, we put in there that there is going to be at least one session scheduled per week penciled in there for players to join if they wish. I like to do this for my West March's campaigns because just having that one bit of consistency can make it so you don't go long stretches where the campaign is just completely fallow. Um, because you might have instances where if it is completely player scheduled that just with how things play out in people's lives, uh, it becomes harder and harder to get people together. So I would at least recommend having one monthly session for a West March's campaign scheduled out, but to each their own. Also, world building information. Uh, my players already know my world, so we'll get into it, but these are all experienced players, so this is something I can really skip. Mission types, talking about the missions that they want to see, uh, talking more about their preferences. I don't need to put everything else here because once you've done... God, how many Session Zeros have I done? At least 20. You kind of know what steps to take. And then I have something here about the home base character creation. And so players can come together and they can start creating as a group. So, this is what Session Zero looks like for me. It's a template that I use and so far has worked very well. So overall, this is the planning that I do before Session Zero for a West March's campaign. The next episode of this series will be all about what we do after Session Zero, creating the campaign and getting the narrative workings fixed so that we can go on and run a spectacular campaign for all the players. I can show you plot webs in action, how we weave character backstories into a West March's campaign, and honestly, I'm really excited to continue this series going forward. Now, if you haven't seen my plot webs video, you can check it out right here, and if you would like, you can go over and support my Patreon. I do offer DM coaching, so if you want one-on-one -on -one help, you can get it over there. And thank you for entering the dungeon.